Hi, I'm Bill Rapis, the Executive Director of Lymphatic Education and Research Network, and I just want to take this opportunity to thank all of you for joining us today for our symposium series. I also want to take this opportunity to thank all of you who become members of LEARN and help support this series so that we can continue bringing this kind of groundbreaking information uh, to you in your homes and offices. Uh, I would also suggest for all of you who have not become members of LEARN, $5 a month, you can become a member of LEARN and help support this programming and the research that we do. Thanks very much for joining us and I look forward to having you become a member. And so what I'm gonna be talking about specifically is the relationship between lymphatics, lymphatic dysfunction, and inflammation. It's actually an old story for me. It's where I started back in the mid 80s working in this area and had gone away from it and essentially come back full circle now. And what you're seeing on my introduction slide is an example of some of the lymphatic vessels and how they actually work. On the case on the left, it's a lymphatic vessel inside the mesentery of the small intestine of an animal model, in this case the rat. And you can see the lymphatic contract and relax and the valves opening and close, as I indicate by the little hand there. On the right hand, it shows you an idea of the, the techniques we now use to take these very small vessels, because they're about the size of a human hair, out, isolate them, cannulate them, and uh, regulate and study their function in an ex vivo situation. So let me give you a little idea of what the overall structure is going to be. Uh, we're going to talk first about lymphatic structure and function, provide an overview of that, discuss the physiology of lymphatics and how they regulate their function, which is primarily transport. Then we'll talk about some uh, newer areas that we've come to investigate in the last half a dozen to eight years, and that's the functional interactions of immunity and immune cells with the lymphatics. We'll go on to discuss inflammation and its effects on lymphatic function and the impact of the alterations in that lymphatic function as a result of that inflammation on either the resolution or sometimes, unfortunately, the maintenance of a chronic inflammatory state. And then lastly, we'll talk about specific changes that we've seen in, in models that we've looked at, uh, different chronic models of inflammation and how that affected lymphatic function, and we believe, in fact, fed back to in influence the chronic inflammation. So let's start with uh, you know, basic principles of uh, uh, the structure of the lymphatic system in, lymph in mammals, including humans. Basically, lymphatics are <clears throat> a vascular network that start off as a network of blind-ended lymphatic capillaries. That's these small vessels up here in this picture, or these small ones over here, where lymph is actually formed from interstitial fluid. Those will feed into the pre-collector vessels and eventually into the muscularized collecting lymphatics and ducts, which are the ones I'm showing you in the outline on the right-hand side, which is the, are the vessels that we predominantly study in my lab. Those uh, collecting vessels will become the afferent lymphatics of a lymph node, depicted here in the bottom. Um, and then they interact with uh, 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 various cells and, and things within that lymph node to, to modulate immune function. And then the lymph will exit that lymph node in the efferent lymphatics or the larger lymphatic ducts, eventually joining into the thoracic duct that drains the lower half of the body in the upper left quadrant. Into the, they join into the subclavian vein and they empty their content, contents, fluid, macromolecules, cytokines, chemokines, and immune cells back into the blood. And in essence, they provide a one-way transport from the tissue spaces to and through the nodes and eventually back to the blood. And in this way, they transport not only fluid that we all know and appreciate, but also large molecules that can't get back into the blood directly, but instead have to enter lymphatics and go through this whole process, as well as very large particulate matter and indeed cells from the interstitial spaces, both the good cells that we normally talk about in terms of immune cells, and sometimes, unfortunately, cells that we're not too keen on, and that's the metastatic cells from cancer tumors. And they travel from these interstitial spaces all the way through the lymphatic network on route to the venous compartment. And so I'll talk briefly just the fact that we have to, whenever we talk about lymph flow, we have to also think about lymph formation because lymph has to be formed and that is formed in those small capillaries that I showed you in the previous illustration. And that lymph is actually fluid that comes from the interstitial space where all the cells in your body basically live. It enters these primary lymphatic capillaries through mechanisms that are frankly not terribly well understood. Um, and in doing so, once it enters this layer of endothelial cells that form the lymphatic capillary, it is now lymph proper. And at that point, you then have to develop the mechanism for moving that lymph from that capillary all the way through the network of vessels to the node and to the blood, as I described in the previous slide. And this depicts just some of the uh, influences of the pressures and, 
and forces that you've got to think about how to get fluid in to form lymph. I'm not going to go into great detail on that. But the other part of this important part of the schematic is that interstitial fluid is also in balance with the uh, blood vasculature. So the capillaries and, and uh, early venules are important aspects of providing blood, providing uh, fluid from blood to become interstitial fluid, which then essentially becomes lymph. And altogether, these three elements work in concert to regulate overall body fluid. And when everything works great, then your body fluid and your body size remains constant. When things get disrupted, either the input or the output, you can get changes in, in body fluid composition, volume, and pressure, um, leading to potentially edema, and in the case of lymphatic dysfunction, specifically lymphedema. Okay, so the lymphatic system has critical roles in fluid and protein homeostasis, as I've already described. It's important in edema resolution, has been discussed historically for over 50 years. We've also known that it's critical for lipid uptake because the vast majority of lipids you ab uh, um, absorb through your gut are taken up first into the lymphatics before they get taken to the blood. And it's also critical for immune cell trafficking. All these tasks require the movement of substances from the tissue spaces into and through this network of lymphatics I described, through the lymph nodes, and then finally into the venous blood. So from our perspective, classically, we looked at the principal function of the lymphatic system as a transportation system to take important elements from tissue spaces to the nodes and eventually on into the blood. And in that process, uh, accomplishes all those critical roles I described in the first part of this slide. The problem is there's very complicated dynamics because typically we often hear and sometimes use the phrase lymph drainage. Um, lymph drainage is a bit of a misnomer because drainage implies that it's flowing down a passive gradient like the sewer system works in your cities. Um, and in fact, most of the time in most of the tissues, it's not quite that simple. Because typically in many tissues, the fluid pressure gradients within the lymphatic network from where it was formed in the initial lymphatics to where it exits the lymphatics in the central veins are in a direction that oppose passive drainage. And an example of that is shown in some, a very old study, but a very elegant study that they did looking at different elements and pressures in the different parts of the lymphatic from the peripheral parts up near the top through subsequent uh, uh, more and more central mech, mech parts of the lymphatic system till it enters the thoracic duct or the right lymphatic duct, which are the two minor outflow paths of the lymphatics before it goes into the veins. And the point of the pressures on the right-hand side, and you don't have to worry about what those mean in terms of uh, centimeters of water, millimeters of mercury, they're fairly similar to one another. But the, the point is, is that it goes from low pressures and it has to flow into high pressures in the veins. That means it's not a passive drainage, that it has to overcome this pressure gradient in order to get there. Because normally fluids move passively from high pressures towards low pressures. So what, pro what produ produces lymph flow and what re prevents movement of fluid from the veins back in the lymphatics we'll be discussing in a, in a few minutes. Secondly, on uh, in important influences of the effect of gravity on lymph pressure and transport, particularly in man who spends significant significant amount of their time upright, because fluids can be affected by gravitational forces. So if you stick a column of fluid about the height of a person uh, in the lymphatic system, you see that the potential gradient of pressure from the head to the great veins of the neck is about positive 30 centimeters of water. That favors central lymph flow. And so in that case, you do get some lymph drainage that is relatively passive because of the effect of gravity on the, the lymphatic system. On the other hand, the majority of lymphatics are in the lower part of the body. And in that case, you're working against gravity and you have to pump it literally uphill from your feet, uh, from the rest of your lower part of your body, up against all this gradient. And you can have a gradient of about 150 centimeters of water in theory and that opposes central lymph flow. Now fortunately there are mechanisms to minimize that gradient. For instance, the valves, they break up that hydrostatic column so you don't get the full 150 centimeter water gradient that could potentially oppose lymph flow, but in fact it's probably about 50 on average in an upright uh, six-foot human. Um, but you still have to overcome that, that pressure gradient to get central lymph flow. So you can see that there are some complicating factors that you have to overcome in order to get lymph flow. Once you get it in lymphatic capillaries to get it through the rest of the vascular system, through the nodes, and out into blood. And uh, other species have developed specialized lymphatic hearts. Mammals do not have them. And so we have to use a different network of pumps and valves, both primary and secondary, to overcome these gradients and move and form lymph from the tissue spaces to get them to the veins. And lymphatic pumps use both intrinsic and extrinsic forces to generate those pressures, 
needed to move the fluid along the lymphatic network. And so to study the function and dysfunction of the lymphatic system, we focus on looking at the functions of these pumps and valves. And I'll give you an example of what one of those valves looks like because they're critical to function of lymphatics. And in fact, one of the more common uh, primary lymphedemas in humans, lymphatic uh, lymphedema, lymphatic dystochiasis um, is related to the dysfunction of the valve system within the lymphatics. And this is showing you an example on the right-hand side of a very, very tiny lymphatic from a rat that we've taken out, isolated, and loaded with certain dyes that we can image them in three dimensions confocally, kind of like you would do with a CAT scan, but in this case with a microscope, and see what the structure of those valves is. And as it spins around, you're about to see the downward direction of the valves, and you can see the outflow of the leaflets there. As it spins around the other way, now you're looking upstream, and you can see the back end of those leaflets. Those leaflets have to open and close in order to prevent uh, and maintain normal net central directed flow. And we've worked with groups, including a dear colleague of mine at Miss Missouri now, that have studied that activity and found, in fact, that there's critical elements of that uh, lymphatic valves that we don't understand very well and that are important for some uh, primary lymphedemas. In addition to the valves, you have to generate energy to move lymph, literally, this uh, uphill against this pressure gradient. And so in that case, we use, and um, the humans and mammals in general use lymphatic pumps. The extrinsic pump, an example of that, is what's in your muscles, skeletal muscles. When you contract and relax skeletal muscles, there are lymphatics in those muscles that pick up fluid and carry it out of the muscle cells. But the pressures that they could generate by mechanisms like you're seeing on screen, which is not in the muscle but instead in the gut, um, are much too low compared to the pressures generated by the muscle contraction. And so the muscle contraction actually compresses and relaxes that lymphatic vessel. And in doing so, uh, generates pressure gradients that squeeze and open those lymphatic bulbs and valves and push fluid out of the lymphatic network in the muscles into the next section of the lymphatic network. Those are the intrinsic, ex extrinsic pumps. Now what we study primarily are the intrinsic pump. And that's what you're seeing on the screen here. This is a, a video from a, um, a lymphatic vessel inside the mesentery of the small intestine of a rat. And it's a live animal and a live vessel and you can see it contracting and relaxing. As it does so, you can see cells move from the right-hand side to the left-hand side that are carried by lymph. Those are immune cells that we'll talk about later. And then you can see the blood cells, blood vessels above and below that serve that vessel metabolically because it needs oxygen and so forth and able to have that contractile activity. And so in essence, this very small vessel, which is again about the size of a human hair when it's at rest, um, needs lots of energy to do that activity and needs this activity to move fluid from the gut wall into the mesenteric node and then from the node all the way to the thoracic duct and into the central veins. And we're going to discuss uh, these mechanisms and what regulates this pumping activity. And this is real time, just so you know I haven't sped it up. And so in essence, this lymphatic not only acts like a vessel to carry the fluid or a conduit, but it acts like a pump to generate the pressures and gradients needed to drive fluid flow within that lymphatic vasculature. And in essence, we analyze that lymphatic vessel and study its diameter over time, as you can see on the left-hand side. And we evaluate its function by looking at it as a vascular parameter, that is, looking at, you, at it like you would a blood vessel, talking about its basal tone and its base, basic diameter, how compliant it is or how easy it is to stretch. And then we evaluate a lot of the pumping characteristics, and we use a cardiac pump analogy. So we talk about systole and diastole of the lymphatic system, where this part is when the diameter quickly diminishes, and it does so in less than half a second, uh, and it greatly diminishes, that generates the pressure gradients needed to move lymph along the lymphatic vessel is the systole, and then the remaining part when it refills in diastole. And we use many cardiac pump analogies that I won't go into details here to evaluate the pump activity of the intrinsic lymph pump. There are lots of things that regulate that pumping activity. Some of the things we focused uh, our efforts on in the last 20, 30 years in my lab have been the intrinsic factors like physical hydrodynamic factors pressure and stretch, flow and shear. I'll give you examples of that in just a, a slide or two. But there are also chemical factors that are released by lymphatic elements in the wall. These can be factors like growth factors um, that are called autocrines because they act on the, the same things as the cells that release them, or they can be paracrine factors because these are elements released by cells of the lymphatic wall, but they feed back onto other cells of the lymphatic wall and modulate its function. Examples of these are the uh, prostanoids released during inflammation. We'll come back to that again later. Nitric oxide, which is also released by the lymphatic endothelium, 
growth factors, and importantly, cytokines that might be released by immune cells in the lymphatics, as you'll see later. In addition to these intrinsic factors, there are lots of extrinsic factors that we haven't focused a lot of our efforts on, with the exception of some of the latter ones down here, but uh, a lot of other people have. And so there's been lots of evaluation of how the nervous system controls lymphatic function. And even though lymphatics work on their own without any innervation, the body has the ability to modulate that basic function that's built into the lymphatics inherently by activation or inhibition of the different neural agents like adrenergic agents, cholinergic agents, and peptidergic agents. These are particularly important, these last peptidergic agents for inflammatory reactions. And then lastly, there can be chemical factors that circulate in blood or circulate in tissue that also do the same thing that your body uses. And what's critical about those is that many of the inflammatory products that we'll discuss briefly later on, such as oxygen radicals, cytokines, and chemokines, those are, those are factors that you find in tissue fluid and in lymph that are uh, uh, bathe both sides of the lymphatic and can alter its function dramatically. So how, do this, how does it work and how does this pumping uh, process work? Well, what we're seeing here is a, a, a confocal image. That is a three-dimensional image of a very small lymphatic that's, again, about the size of a human hair that we've taken out of the tissue, isolated, loaded with a dye so we can see it and measure it uh, in a three-dimensional confocal microscope. And then we reconstruct those images. And you can see as this is spinning around, we've cut it in half so you can see the inside of the vessel now with those little bumps that were the endothelial cells and nuclei. And now the outside of the vessel where these kind of longitudinal shaped vessels or cells in the vessel are actually the smooth muscle cells within the lymphatic wall that generate this contractile force. And importantly, while we focused our, our energies and efforts predominantly on those two in the last 10 or 20 years, there are also a number of important cells that are there. You can see these other cells like this one and this one and this one that are a little bit differently shaped and also some nerves that lie along there that influence that as well. We're going to come back to all of those, but it's predominantly the interaction between the endothelium that senses lymphatic function and the muscle cell that lymphatic, senses lymphatic function that generate the contractions that drive lymphatic pumping and thus drive lymph flow throughout most of the network of the body. So what we've done with lots of work is evaluated lymphatics from the perspective of both a, a blood vessel, or sorry, a lymph vessel, a conduit, to carry fluid and to pump to drive fluid. And what we know is that the lymphatics have functional and, char and calcium characteristics of both of those structures. And so they're interesting from the perspective that they serve as both a pump and a conduit to do that. So how do they generate pumps? Well, the lymphatic muscle cells, or some part of the lymphatic, have electrical pacemaker activity that's similar to the heart, um, generates electrical activity that regulates and drives this phasic contraction and this pumping activity. It generates what are called action potentials that can propagate along those various cells from one to another via these gap junctions. And then those action potentials um, will have associated with the electrical activity some calcium changes. And that is there is a rapid release of calcium associated with that electrical activity that in fact we believe drives this pumping activity. In addition to the pumping activity, lymphatics have tone, similarly you see in blood vessels. So when your doctor talks to you about hypertension and that you have too high blood pressure, it's because your, in most cases your arteries have generated too much tone or constriction of them, and that increases the pressure. And lymphatics can have the same thing. But typically the lymphatics work at a much lower tone than blood vessel. And so they have both these um, fast phasic contractions that drive pumping and the slow tonic contraction that drive control of resistance and tone and modulate flow within the lymphatic activity. And our lab has focused mostly on understanding how we investigate uh, the lymphatic muscle and epithelium to accomplish this. Um, briefly, we know that again, as I indicated, that calcium is an important cellular regulator of it. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail of this here, um, but the important part is that means that it kind of acts somewhat similar to the cells of the heart that have a calcium dynamics that drive their contraction, their rapid contraction. Lymphatics have many similarities to that, including many of the proteins that regulate the calcium within the lymphatic muscle, somewhat similar to what's regulating the um, uh, calcium in both cardiac muscle as well as smooth muscle in the, in the blood vessels, and we're investigating that. And what that means is that when patients get treated for cardiac uh, dysfunction with calcium regulating uh, drugs or hypertension with calcium migrating drugs, it can have an impact on lymphatic function as well. So 
once you've got the calcium rises that accomplish and drive these either phasic or tonic contractions, you need how, to know how that calcium is coupled to the actual proteins in the muscle, the actin and myosin proteins, the so-called contractile proteins, that generate both the fast phasic activity and the slow tonic activity. Because normally you don't find those two activities in the same types of muscle in most other uh, um, muscle beds within the body. And so what we know is that these uh, lymphatic muscles are kind of a unique character in that they have characteristics of the contractile proteins, the two main ones, actin and myosin, that are similar to what you see in heart and similar to what you see in skeletal muscle and in similar to what you see in some smooth muscles, like you see typically in blood vessels and some GI muscles, and that they use this unique combination that we haven't found in any other muscle type to generate these types of activities and produce both pumping activity and maintain flow and tone. Now, I indicated before that my lab uh, is really interested in understanding how the intrinsic characteristics of this lymphatic pumping are altered by forces within the vessel itself. And to do that, we de develop techniques with the help of uh, other uh, collaborators to isolate these vessels and cannulate them. And you can see one end of the glass cannula here. And what you see is that what people have known for over 60 years is that when you stretch these vessels by increasing the pressure in them, like you would get with increased lymph formation, you stimulate those vessels to contract faster and rapider. And what you see on the left-hand side is a vessel that's been isolated from a rat that's at a low pressure of one centimeter of water, which is very, very low compared to blood pressure, by the way. And when we stimulate that by raising it to five, you can see the activity of that same vessel increases dramatically. That's depicted in this lower graph where you increase step pressures, you get increases in the contraction diameter and contraction frequency and strength of those vessels until you reach a point where they begin to fail. And we're studying the interactions of the stretch and activating different elements of the lymphatic to figure out how this is regulated. Well, in addition to stretch, you can also regulate it through other, another important uh, intrinsic hydrodynamic factor, and that is shear. Because just like in blood vessels, as lymph flows through this tube, it rubs on the endothelial cells that I showed you in that green confocal image that line the lymphatic. And that, invest, uh, that uh, you know, rubbing on the lymphatic endothelium activates a number of processes that modulates that function. And what this slide is showing you is that shear, at least high steady shear, as we did in this particular experiment, will take a vessel like you see on the left-hand side that's been isolated and pressurized with no shear on it. The only shear that's going in this vessel is that generated by the pumping activity itself. And that's relatively low in phasic versus what we have here where we've imposed a relatively high flow, which means that it's being stimulated by shear in the lymphatic endothelium. And you see that the pumping activity is gone um, or greatly diminished. This is particularly true in the larger vessels of the, of the lymphatic network. And this particular one is one, a fairly large vessel from the rat in the neck. Um, and you can see that, that that shear can modulate lymphatic function dramatically. And we've been spending a lot of our efforts to investigate the molecular mechanisms by which this works normally, and then how it doesn't work so well uh, abnormally in various pathologies I'll get to at the end. And just to show you, an ins and, and I don't expect anyone to spend a lot of time figuring this out, but we found it very, very useful to collaborate with our, our engineering colleagues and use a lot of the principles that they use to understand flow and shear and pressures and, and so forth in, in fluid dynamics, in pipes and in air streams and so forth, to apply those same principles to understand lymphatic function. And this is an example of where we've taken some of the data from those confocal microscopic images and some of the measures of flow and pressure and shear and use them to evaluate important um, uh, functions of lymphatic, fun of lymphatic uh, flow acting on the vessel by using what's called CFD or computational uh, fluid dynamics to understand what the different shears and profiles are. And basically the different colors in this bottom picture here depict the gradient of low shear in green to very, very high shears at the output of that valve structure. And this makes a big we believe makes an, uh, an important difference in how these vessels work normally and how they may not work abnormally, particularly if you stretch the vessels and stretch the valves. So we use that a lot to understand the basic principles of the regulation of lymph flow. And eventually, we believe that those principles will be important to understanding uh, the, the pathologies that occur in various forms of lymphatic dysfunction, in, in particular in the
So now we want to get on to the, the latter part of the topic, and that is getting on how lymph transport and inflammation are, are tied together intimately. And this is not a new association. In fact, it's what got me interested in lymphatics back in the mid-80s as a student, that people had known that uh, while lymphatics have this unique transport system, um, they didn't, we didn't really well understand how it worked then as, as good as we do now. But they did know that inflammation can modulate it dramatically. In some cases, certain types of inflammatory products will, will activate that pumping and increase lymph flow. In other cases, will do just the opposite, that inflammatory agents can inhibit that pump and in decrease lymph flow and transport. And so the classic cardinal signs of inflammation are pain, heat, redness, swelling, and tissue dysfunction. The, this one here is associated with a number of things, in, in potentially including um, some of the classical neurotransmitters like substance P that are neurogenic pain modulators in, in substance P sensitive neurons in various tissues, certainly in the gut, that we find are highly uh, uh, upregulated lymphatics. So we think that some of the things of in, some of the pain associated with inflammation are perhaps sensed by lymphatic vessels or the nerves that are associated with lymphatic vessels. Heat and stress are more, in, uh, sorry, heat and redness are more related to changes in vascular function, that is blood vascular function. But the last two, and certainly this one, swelling, is classically associated with lymphatic dysfunction. Because we know, as well as blood vascular dysfunction, we know that during inflammation, blood vessels get leaky, they leak a lot more fluid out to the tissue, and lymphatics are there normally to remove that. And so historically, lymphatics have increased their activity to pump more fluid out of that tissue and bring the inflammation swelling uh, and edema back down to normal so they help to resolve it. But that under certain conditions, depending on what types of inflammation are going on, what types of cytokines are being produced by what types of activated immune system, immune cells, that that swelling can get worse, not better, because the lymphatics actually get, dysfun get dysfunctional and they no longer work properly. And so the classic idea that lymphatics play a critical role in, in prevention and resolution of edema can be disrupted by various types of inflammatory agents. And that then leads to swelling and dysfunction of that tissue. Um, and so more recently, we began evaluating the characteristics of lymphatic vessels and how other cells, other than the lymphatic endothelium, in addition to the lymphatic endothelium and muscle cell, primarily immune cells, both in the vessel, in the lumen, in the wall of the vessel, and right outside of the wall of the vessel, may play a role in both immune system processes and the inflammation that's associated with some of those. And so, to, to lead into this a bit more, what I want to describe is that the function of the lymphatic system, other than fluid transport, really play critical roles in different phases of inflammation and in immune responses to both foreign agents and self-recognition. Um, and we know that lymph flow carries not only the fluid we've talked about so far, but also that fluid contains lots of immune cells, lots of immune antigens, both foreign and self, and those antigens are the things that tell the immune system what to do, to fight or not to fight um, against those antigens. They also, the lymph also carries lots of inflammatory and immunological cytokines and chemokines that get released predominantly from innate immune cells out in the tissue spaces. And it carries all those elements through the fluid uh, and in lymph to the nodes and then from the nose to the blood. And that we know that this transport is absolutely critical to the development and resolution of inflammatory and immune responses. And so what are the, some of the classically acknowledged roles of lymphatics and immunity? Well, one of the important ones is the transport of antigen, as I've already described. Uh, the, and antigens are usually uh, large molecules, proteins, glycoproteins, some lipoproteins, and those come from the interstitium, whether they're from foreign agents like infections, or from degradation of products or metastatic cells um, from the interstitial spaces, they got to be taken through the lymphatics into the nodes um, by the lymph, and then they're uptaken there by node-resident interdigitating dendritic cells, and that initiates the whole learned immune response. So you couple the uh, antigen processes of normal and abnormal uh, uh, reactions to the cells in the node that transition from innate immunity, which is the ones that don't rely on lymphocytes, to the learned immunity. And lymphatics are the principal route of transport for these large antigens, which are macromolecules, particles, as well as the cells, the dendritic cells themselves, to carry them from the interstitium to the node. That's a classical understanding of, even though we don't understand all the steps of that, we, and most immunologists, 
have a good acknowledgement of the role of this lymphatics in this particular process. Secondly, um, though we frankly don't understand it really well, the lymph lymphocytes are named lymphocytes in large part because they're carried predominantly from the node to places via the lymphatics. So in other words, they get from the interstitium to the nodes via afferent lymphatics, and then more importantly, after you've modulated the, trans the learned immune response and changed T and B cell lymphocytes, you need to get them from the nodes to the circulating blood. And while some of that can occur directly into the high endothelial venules or blood vessels in the node, a lot of it occurs via transport of lymph lymphocytes from the node to the blood vessels via the efferent lymphatics, or that is the large lymphatic conduits. And lastly, is that it's acknowledged that the professional antigen presenting cells, these are th those that are MHC2 positive in the lexicon of immunologists, are, are trafficked predominantly to and from the node, particularly to the node, um, uh, which initiates the immune reactions that were described above via uh, lymphatic vessels. And these types of cells are dendritic, Langerhans cells, macrophages, and also B cells. And so those are the acknowledged um, mechanisms that are, play a big role for lymphatic function in immunity. Even though we don't understand all the steps of their involvement, most people understand that. And this is just a depiction of that in a more schematic way that I'm going to go over quickly. But foreign antigens will typically be taken up classically into these lymphatic capillaries and they can be carried naked or they can be carried attached to an antigen presenting cell that enters these lymphatic vascular space and then traffics through this whole network to get to the node to activate immune responses. And that can happen in the skin um, uh, in lymphatic tissue as I've depicted here and in the GI lymphatic tissue that we un, um, um, understand better and investigate more in my lab on the lower right hand side. Um, so about 10 years ago, we began getting more focused and interested in this analysis of what role the in, lymphatics play in immunological functions and how that impacts lymphatic function itself. Um, and in particular, to get this started, we compared using from very fancy genomic techniques the, in, the, the expression of different gene patterns in lymphatic vessels compared to blood vessels. And to make a long story short, even though we were looking for other things related to endothelial function and, and muscle function, we did find some of those, but the predominant differences that we find by these very powerful techniques is that the lymphatics are highly expressing things related to antigen processing, antigen presentation, IgE receptor signaling related to um, in, in immunity and uh, in infections, as well as predominantly uh, responses to allergens and immune response to infection generally. And so what we've seen is that the lymphatics are actually highly enriched in immune function genes compared to blood vessels. And so it fits with the idea of where they're located in this lymphatic network. That is, they're posed to bring things to the node and from the node. They bring it to the node from the interstitium, and they take things from the node back to the blood. And then once it's in the blood, then it can be distributed to all parts of the body via the blood circulation. So we started looking at what gave lymphatics this in genetic enrichment and the special a fingerprint that um, makes them look special for immunological functions. And one of the things that was predominantly upregulated are things related to antigen presentation and antigen presenting cells, or APCs. And uh, by definition, the ones we were looking at were MHC2 positive. And this is a special protein complex, MHC2, is, is a special protein complex that those cells use to carry antigen information from either foreign sources or self sources and either train the learned uh, uh, the T and B cells to mount a reaction against the foreign sources or to recognize the self antigens that it's yourself and you don't want to develop an autoimmune response against that. And what we eventually seen is in doing some uh, significant amount of work to figure out why the lymphatics were so enriched in that, that particular set of genes is that they have this vast network of lymphatic uh, d hosted uh, antigen presenting cells that literally live in the wall of the lymphatic. So what we have here at the bottom of the screen is an isolated lymphatic vessel, similar to what you've seen earlier. This is from a rat mesenteria, so there's a small intestinal lymphatic downstream of the gut but upstream of the node. And we've d flushed all of the cells inside the vessel out and then we stain it with techniques and antibodies that recognize this MHC2 or elements of that MHC2 complex. And what you see are all these cells. This is essentially the edge of the lymphatic wall. 
Here is the bulge that you see right around, or the lymphatic sinus, and then right about here is where we would see one of the valves you've seen earlier. And you see a tremendous association of these cells in the wall. This is a cell, I mean, this is a vessel from an animal that was not sick. It was healthy by all understanding of what we knew. And so what we discovered is that we normally th knew that these cells or cells like them are carried in lymph, and you find them out in the tissue around lymphatics. But we did not understand that there's a huge investment of these cells within the wall of lymphatic. And that's in part what gave us this unique genetic signal that we identified with those other uh, trans transcript techniques. And you can see some of these uh, uh, cells in a little bit higher mag magnification above over here, where you can see the cell is very complex and has lots of, and zoomed in on a single one, has lots of what we call these cell extensions that we call den dendrites. And so we discussed these as though they were dendritic cells. Um, and there's some debate over whether these are really dendritic cells or a specialized uh, form of macrophages that can also do antigen presentation. And we're working with colleagues and ourselves to kind of figure that out right now. But what we know is that those cells are, are very predominant in the lymphatics, and they're there. And the question is, what do they do? Um, they're located in a wall of the vessel, but can those vessels actually capture antigen from somewhere, presumably carried in lymph, and do anything with them? Well, first you have to know where they are in that wall, because to get access to lymph, they have to have access to the lumen. And we did staining here in green for those cells, and then red for the muscle cells of the lymphatic that line the wall. And what we see is those MHC2 cells lie above the muscle, between the muscle, and their cell bodies lie below the muscle. Um, okay, that doesn't give them access to the lumen yet. So we did other staining where we take the same types of vessels and doing confocal uh, microscopy. We can see where here the cells are again stained in green, but now the blue staining is the lymphatic endothelium. So that's the lining of the lymphatic vessel that senses flow, but it also is the only barrier between where those cells are and where the antigen potentially is in lymph. And so you can see the direction of lymph flow. Here's another valve, and you can see the association of these cells with the blue. And these two structures here, and it's a little more detail they want to get into, but basically what they tell us is that their cell bodies lie above this lymphatic endothelial layer. So the cell bodies themselves are not exposed to the lymph in the lumen, but those extensions can be. And in fact, particularly around the valve leaflets and in the sinus region, we know that they are. So in essence, they're positioned and poised in order to be able to sample antigens and other cytokines and such from the lymph from, take, from places upstream. In this case, it would be from the gut and then modulate their activity and function. And so uh, a simple uh, idea, of, so they're poised correctly, can they actually do that? And this is a, um, an experiment where we injected a foreign antigen in the wall of the gut, and the foreign antigen is a fluorescently tagged bovine albumin, and it's in a rat small intestine. We inject a very tiny amount, 50 microliters in the gut wall, that's basically miles upstream in the lymphatic network from where we're observing these. And we took images then in the, no the vessels, lymphatic vessels that lead right into the mesenteric node. And the green in this case indicates this fluorescent antigen. And you can see this red line indicates the edge of the lymphatic. So here the lymphatic is. We don't have the whole vessel in the field of view. But you can see the green contained in the lymph, that is the fluid, and that these cells, similar to what you've seen in previous slides, or we believe similar to what you've seen in previous slides, can actually sample that lymph or antigen from lymph that was injected far, far upstream, capture it, and then begin to process it. And that's a higher magnification of that within the lymphatic vessel and a lymphatic dendritic cell or antigen presenting cell of some sort, capturing that antigen, and you can see it packaging into these little vesicles inside the cell. So, in other words, those cells are poised to be able to sample antigen. Now the question is, so they do that, what do they do next? And frankly, that's where the work we've been currently focusing on is understanding what those cells do, where they do it, and who they talk to. And we presume that they're talking to some element, since they are part of the innate immune system, that they're talking to the elements of the learned immune system, that is the lymphocytes. And we're trying to figure out exactly where that is. Um, we know that lymphatic vessels have association with a great number of other immune cells that I don't have time to go into that are typically innate immune cells like mast cells, neutrophils, um, various other types of innate immune cells, and that those cells can alter the, the function of the lymphatics by interacting with other immune agents either in lymph or in around the vessel itself. And so that means that they can be involved in not only the inflammation but in the lymphatic response to the inflammation.
because those cells, in essence, release a lot of those inflammatory products and mediators that I said circulate um, in blood and in tissue fluid in an earlier slide that can act on lymphatics. Some of them can activate the lymphatic pump and stimulate lymph flow. Others of them can inhibit it. And so we're, we begin studying those interactions a little more carefully than we had in the past because we see that there's a tremendous number of these cells um, of not only the type that I've shown you, but also three or four other important types of immune cells um, that can modulate lymphatic function. In fact, we know now modulate lymphatic function. And we believe now that they may import, be important characters in the transition of lymphatics um, in different phases of inflammation, as well as their responses to different activities of the immune system. And so we started looking at um, pathologies, and we, and we haven't spent a lot of our time looking at classic lymphedemia that most of, our, most of the previous webinar uh, speakers have discussed. Um, but in fact, we know that the little bit we have, that lymphedema in, classic, in two of the most classic forms, um, particularly the transition of lymphedema from acute to chronic phases, such as you see in cancer uh, therapies and after neural resection from cancer, so secondary lymphedema, as, as predominantly those associated with breast cancer, for instance, that Dr. Mortimer recently talked about in a webinar, as well as those associated with the most common lymphatic edema and lymphatic disease in the world, that's lymphatic filariasis from the filarial worm infection that you see in, in parts of Asia and South, South America, that those chronic forms of lymphedema while they represent inabilities to of the lymphatics to transport lymph and remove fluid, they also re represent in the chronic phases a transition of the tissue that's affected, the leg or the arm or whatever it may be, to the gross and chronic inflammation that occurs because not only can the lymphatics not transport fluid, but they can't transport normally any of the other things contained in lymph, the cytokines, the chemokines, and most importantly perhaps the immune cells that have to get from the tissue spaces to the node and from the node to the blood. Um, because when you impair lymph flow, you impair transport of all those agents. And so we've looked at um, a couple of different models of inflammation in rather non-traditional forms of lymphedema and looked at what happens with them and what happens to lymphatic function and do they play or does lymphatic function play a role in the development of those syndromes. In one model in collaboration with uh, Dr. Muthuchami, uh, a colleague here, We've used models of metabolic syndrome in rodents, and a metabolic syndrome is a very common problem in the U.S. that's related to uh, diabetes, hypertension, cardiac dysfunction. Um, that is a real growing, um, it's not a pathology by itself, but a syndrome of a number of pathologies that's causing great problems in our medical health care system and great problems for, for patients around the U.S. As, around, as, as well as around the world now. And what we know is that part of that metabolic syndrome is lipid dysfunction. We know that lymphatic function is critical to lipid, normal lipid function and lipid metabolism and uptake and processing. And so we investigated whether the lymph transport, i.e. via the lymph pump function, is modulated during a model of metabolic syndrome where we feed the animals a particular diet, diet that gives them very you know, modest metabolic syndrome, but the beginning phase of it. And what we've seen briefly is that the lymphatic pump function is significantly decreased as is the sensitivity and contractile response to the lymphatic muscles to calcium, the thing that initiates these contractile reactions. So what this means is in a, in a growing meta, um, medical problem in the United States, metabolic syndrome, that in addition to the classically identified pathologies and, and problems associated with vasculature, metabolic dysfunction, uh, insulin uh, insensitivity, and so forth, that there's actually lymphatic pump function that is impaired during this, which we believe contributes to the general, uh, what's called meta-inflammation, the chronic inflammation associated with the long-term uh, uh, investment of metabolic syndrome in those patients. And we believe that the inability of lymphatic to transport not only lipids, but also cytokines, chemokines, and immune cells may be partially responsible for that, and we're investigating that more thoroughly, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Uh, next, the next model we've used is a couple models of inflammatory bowel disease. And while this is not a classic lymphedema, in fact, the original founders of lymphatic and namers of, of lymphatic bowel disease, Dr. Crone, who published work 80 years ago on this, and for whom one of the most common IBD diseases is named after, um, indicated that there appeared to be lymphatic dysfunction with some in, their, in their very earliest publications. And a number of others along the way have looked at that, 
but none have uh, mechanistically, or very few until recently, have mechanistically evaluated that. And we, in working with some colleagues at other places in, in the U.S. and Canada, have started looking at that more carefully and seen some uh, a lymphatic dysfunction that is uh, severely compromised in some models of IBD, some classic models as well as some non-classic models. And I'll talk about some of those uh, in just another minute. So going back to metabolic syndrome, we developed a model of rat metabolic syndrome and we evaluated limp pump function in the very earliest phases of the, of the beginning of the transition to a chronic metabolic syndrome. So the animals have the indications of metabolic syndrome, though it's very early phases of it. And what we see is even there, limp pump function is significantly decreased, primarily through decrease in the pacemaking activity of the cells, of the lymphatics and the cells that drive that pacemaking, resulting in reduction of lymph flow. The lymphatic muscle um, and its ability to generate contractions to calcium signals is profoundly reduced. And that impairs the ability of the lymphatic muscle to generate appropriate contractile responses, we believe. And that the lymphatic vessels themselves are substantially reduced in size um, so that they have, uh, appears to have some significant vessel remodeling because of the impairment of function. Uh, this results in an increase in outflow resistance. So even if the vessels do pump, they have to pump against a greater resistance to overcome this, uh, uh, out, the, to overcome the outflow resistance and move lymph downstream, which would diminish lymph flow. And lastly, there's a significantly increased number, amount of perivascular, perilymphatic adipose tissue, which is a chronic sign of metabolic syndrome, with an inflamed vascular phenotype and a fairly clear apparent immune cell recruitment and modulation of the immune cells associated both with those adipose cells that surround the lymphatics and the lymphatics themselves. Going on to the IBD um, models that we studied, and we had done two, we'll talk about the more classic one now, is when we studied uh, a technique that you use to uh, develop IBD in rodents, we've seen that in situ, that is in the, ve in, the, in the vessels in this animal, live animal, lymph flow falls dramatically and falls early, within a day or two. Um, whereas IBD, chronically, doesn't develop till 10 to 14 days. Like, in addition to that, lymph immune cell density within the lymph increases markedly, again, within this case, within a couple of hours. Uh, we know that some of the inflammatory products that are associated with both IBD, inflammation in general, and lymphatic dysfunction, like INOS and TNF-alpha, go up ra rapidly in the gut, in the mesenteric tissues, and importantly, in the lymphatic vessels that drain that gut or remove fluid from that gut through the mesentery. Also, we see very rapid changes in inflammatory cell investment on the mesenteric lymphatic vessels. And that these vessels, when you isolate them from the tissues, they still pump, though they're modulated and they're impaired. But in situ, they appear not to pump at all. And so this data suggests that lymphatic, and this, all these elements occur very, very early on in the development of IBD, uh, much earlier than would be associated with the chronic phase. And so that suggests that lymphatic dysfunction and reduced lymph flow plays an early crucial role in the development and transition to a chronic state of inflammation and maybe in part due to trapping of inflammatory cells in the gut and associated tissues. Likewise, we found a very unexpected similar idea um, or pr principle occurring in a model of lymphatic dysfunction that we have identified about 8-10 years ago in working with NASA where we're trying to uh, simulate uh, microgravity for like astronauts would experience in long-term space flight by using a hind limb and loaded model where you essentially um, elevate the, the back end of, a, of the rat or the mouse to change the hydrostatic pressure gradients in there to simulate somewhat what, what happens under microgravity. And while we've seen previously that there's a profound lymphatic dysfunction throughout the whole body in those animals when you do that, and that's you know, not terribly dissimilar from what you see in long-term bed rest and other models of microgravity that NASA has used. But we also recently observed that there's a very similar GI inflammation not dramatically different, though not quite as profound in some elements, as what we've seen with the previous model I just talked about, which is a TNBS model of GI inflammation. And so in addition to the well-known fluid shifts that occur in, in microgravity uh, and upper body edema that occurs, there's impaired immune cell trafficking and other symptoms that long-term space flight may actually produce lymphatic dysfunction, which in the gut may lead to some symptoms of uh, um, inflammatory bowel disease that are not as severe as those we've used with other uh, models that are more chronic models of IBD, 
but uh, can help uh, explain some of the issues that astronauts have exposed uh, have that have been exposed to long-term microgravity have seen in space. So in summary, I want to say the lymphatic system has to transport elements via lymph flow from the tissue spaces to and through the lymph nodes en route to the blood to accomplish all of its major tasks. The conditions to develop and regulate that lymph flow are very complex and not as simple as people had presumably uh, thought before. And given the prevailing pressure gradients normally seen in the body, the lymphatics have to use pumps to overcome these pressure gradients to drive flow and valves, efficient valves, to minimize their backflow. Um, elements of lymph, such as the immune cells that are carried in lymph, large macromolecules, antigens, cytokines, chemokines, and importantly, um, the, those related to inflammation must also be carried by lymph flow to and from for normal function of the body fluid uh, regulation, immune function, and inflammation. And that interactions of these non-fluid elements, which we classically have not thought about a lot in the past, as well as many of the, uh, our, our clinical scientists and clinicians haven't haven't thought about a lot because we didn't understand it very much, but we need to think about them, how they modulate lymph flow and thus function and can lead to the development, maintenance, or resolution of inflammation. And we think that this will have a long-term impact on our ability to think about uh, solving or addressing uh, therapies for the long-term problems associated with different forms of, of lymphedema, even those classic ones as uh, other um, speakers at the webinars here have talked about, as well as some of the non-classic ones that I've described today that uh, we now know are affiliated with some gross inflammation and lymphatic dysfunction. And uh, I'd like to thank all the people that are listed here and some others that I probably have missed that are involved in, in helping do these studies, and of course the great support from NIH to help us do this, as well as the Lymphatic Research Foundation Fellowship which somehow got cut off on this grant that some of our uh, postdocs have had. Um, I'll be happy at this point to try to address questions that you can give me via the chat session. Um, uh, and, and the first question I started to address before we got uh, disrupted was, do some of these principles that I've described of lymphatic function apply to human and human disease? And the, the short answer is, in most cases, we are not sure, but in a number of cases, we um, know that elements of this are critical to lymphatic function and disease in human patients. For instance, FOXC2 uh, impairment and ge genetic mutations and FOXC2 gene lymph lead to lymphatic uh, lymphedema and, and dystochiasis and uh, the problems associated with patients with that disease. Though we're not clear on understanding all the principles of the long-term effects of that, that's a developmental valve dysfunction that leads to long-term dysfunction in patients. Um, we know that's an example of one that does. We know from exa uh, examples of classic lymphedema from breast cancer-related therapies that Dr. Mortimer, Dr. Roxon, and I think Dr. Marara talked about before that a lot of these elements apply. Um, we know that the lymphatic vessels in human actually ex experience and exhibit stronger contractile activities than what we've shown in rat, presumably because they have to overcome a, a higher pressure gradient in humans. Um, and in fact have many of this lymphatic pump activity in most tissues of the body. So that perspective we know is true. Um, we know in lymphedema associated in the gut with IBD that in fact that uh, lymphatic dysfunction occurs because that was actually first done in humans before people ever started looking at it in animal models. And we're working towards understanding that uh, relationship a bit better there. Some of the others are less well studied, unfortunately. And there's not a, a tremendous number of groups outside of ours and a couple others in the, in the U.S. and world that are studying this activity in, in, in either animal models or, or humans. But that's beginning to change. And through efforts of LEARN and other, other uh, elements of, of science and uh, uh, lymphatic biology stimulation, that that's beginning to change. And there are some, some groups beginning to study these same principles using human tissues and human lymphatics, including us. Okay, the next question is, how do these issues that I've described uh, relate to the process of lymphangiogenesis and lymphatic growth factors that you've heard about before? Um, well, this is an important thing um, because they're very intimately tied. Basically, all the lymph that I talked today about being pumped and moved from different parts of the lymphatic vascular tree first has to be formed, and that's formed in the lymphatic capillaries that are upstream of the vessels I've described. 
and where people have focused their energies on lymphangiogenesis are those lymphatics upstream, i.e. the lymphatic capillaries or initial lymphatics where lymph is actually formed. And most of those growth factors, in fact, work at their primary function is on growth of those vessels. Um, more work more recently has gone into kind of the transition of those vessels and how they change from a capillary where it's only the endothelium and there's no muscle um, to a collector lymphatic and muscularized lymphatic where they get invested with lymphatic muscle and they have the types of activities I've described. We're beginning to understand through work of ours and, and lots of other groups that how that development process works and how um, sometimes it doesn't work. And so that's beginning to get started. And so they're related, yet they're important. there's important differences. They're looking at different parts of the vascular, lymphatic vascular bed that have different functions, and both of which have to work together in concert. Because remember, whatever they form there has to leave the lymphatic capillaries. And whatever we pump has to come from the lymphatic capillaries. Um, and so they have to work in concert. And that's an area that we hope will be uh, expanded in the future. Um, next question, is the pacemaker the same as what used to be called automyogenic cells? Well, in essence, if it's the same exact cell is a bit of a question, because to be honest with you, we don't know where, what the pacemaker cells quite yet are in the lymphatic system. We know where they reside. They reside in the muscle cell layer, and some people believe they are muscle cells. Others believe they're specialized cells, like you have in the gut, or somewhat similar to what you have in the heart. Um, and we don't know the answer to that yet. So the short answer to that question is they're probably the same, though we don't have enough information on that on the basic principles of, of that uh, a cell type yet uh, to really answer that adequately. And it's I know it's an area of lots of investigation of lots of groups developmentally, um, as well as people that we interact with, uh, uh, Dr. Vonderweide up in Calgary and others in uh, um, different parts of the world. Um, next question is how does the lymphatic lumen change during inflammatory state versus a basal state? Um, and the second part of that question is how does it change its permeability? Well, the lymphatic lumen during inflammation depends on the type of inflammation and the phase. There can be phases where you see at first the lumen can decrease. And for example, we've done some studies where we looked at the uh, the the the, the uh, Chemicals called reactive oxygen species, which are superoxide and hydrogen peroxide, these are things that are produced um, by immune cells when they get activated to kill other cells, uh, invading cells and bacteria and viruses. And those reactive oxygen species also affect lots of vascular functions and blood vessel and lymphatics. And what we've seen in acute studies that in fact that those reactive oxygen species, once they get high enough, actually inhibit the pumping, they cause a constriction of the lymphatics initially, but that later on, if those diminish, because they're very short-lived, if they diminish and the inflammation is resolved appropriately, um, the, the lymphatics can resume normal activity and they will redilate and go back to their normal act, uh, ideas of size and function. If the damage is too severe, what happens is that lymphatic, we believe, uh, it exhibits some cell death, and we're investigating that now, and that the damage caused by those inflammatory um, uh, chemicals can be so profound that they no longer work right. And in fact, what we see is the vessel that used to be acutely constricted now gets massively dilated, but it no longer constricts, and so it no longer can generate or regulate flow. And that we pretty certain results in edema in the tissues upstream of that. Now, the second part of that was how does it change its permeability? So um, blood vessels, particularly those very small vessels, vessels in the microcirculation like the capillaries and the small venules, they're the places where fluids leak out of the blood, go to the interstitium, and then carry with it glucose and oxygen to the cells of your body to let those cells function. The lymphatic vessels, lymphatic capillaries, take those things up, the fluid as well as other uh, elements of uh, metabolism, into form lymph, and then carry it downstream. And in both cases, understanding the permeability, that is how leaky the blood vessels are, or how leaky the lymphatic vessels are, are a critical element in understanding the relationship and the homeostasis that is keeping tissue volume static, and so that you don't swell up. And because you don't want things to leak too much out of blood vessels, and when they do, you want lymphatics to be able to take them out, take them up, and not leak them back out. 
And so while there's a great understanding of how that changes in blood vessels and the permeability of capillaries and veins in blood vessels during inflammation and immune reactions, there's much, much less understood about those same processes in lymphatic vessels, whether they're lymphatic capillaries or whether they're lymphatic vessels downstream. The capillaries historically have thought to have been extremely permeable because they have big openings between the cells, the endothelial cells that make their, their wall up. And those openings can allow not only large macromolecules, but even large particles in whole cells go through them. And so when you have those large openings, their effective permeability barrier is thought to be relatively low. But it hasn't been, it hasn't been well studied re recently in looking at it mechanistically. Downstream of that, um, it's been even poor, less studied, although there's a few groups recently that have started looking at that and found some very surprising results that the, those vessels downstream, the vessels that we study in essence, the muscularized ones, they have a permeability. They were thought to be like basically concrete pipes that don't leak almost anything out. We now know that that's wrong, completely wrong. And in fact, that those, even those muscularized lymphatics are extremely leaky. They're about as leaky as the veins are in the blood side, which is one of the most blood, leaky blood vessels. So they're a lot more leaky to large proteins than we thought they might be historically. And what role that plays yet remains to be determined. Uh, how this changes during different roles of inflammation and immune response is at this point anyone's guess because it hasn't been studied. Um, next question is how do I find a physician in my area that understands metabolic syndrome as it's related to diminished lymphatic system? Uh, frankly, it's probably going to be nigh on impossible because that field of study and those experiments so far have been conducted only by our lab group uh, here, um, although I know they're being carried on by a couple of new groups uh, looking more from the standpoint of lymphangiogenesis and lymphatic endothelial function and how that changes in metabolic syndrome. Um, so that, that data is really relatively new. It's literally a couple years old. And so for sure it hasn't gotten into the popular or clinical lexicon. And so you know, we're having a hard time just getting most physicians to understand principles of lymphatic biology that we knew pretty well 20 years ago. And getting to understand the very new ones has been a great challenge. That uh, that good thing is people like uh, the group at LEARN are really working diligently, as well as others, um, working diligently to try to tr change the training of our physicians so they understand these principles better. But it will be a while before they do that, before that occurs. And in essence, what you have to find is doctors that have been interested enough to want to go and dig in the literature to start finding this out, as well as the fact that we're now getting people like myself that are basic scientists are being asked by clinical groups and at clinical meetings to describe what's going on. So I, I hope in the very near future that'll start changing. Um, a few other questions that I got is, I'm under lymphedema therapy. We were taught that there is no diet for lymphedema. Does this indicate that anti-inflammatory diet would benefit lymphedema? Um, you know, I think that depends on the specifics of a diet because there are lots of diets that claim to be anti-inflammatory and may work for one particular inflammatory process but not work for others, so you have to be careful. What, what I will say, uh, so for diet, it's, it's, it, it's, a, it's a question that frankly hasn't been answered yet. And that's true for not only from the lipid perspective, which is important to lymphatic function, dysfunction, but also what you're, you were asking about. Um, wh what I will say is that there's been a renewed interest from many, many groups, including most of those that gave webinars to date on this uh, uh, Learn webinar site, that are looking at exactly the issue of inflammation and its impact in the development and maintenance and treatment of chronic lymphedema. And that I expect that it, it, while we may or may not have information about uh, dietary in influences. I suspect that that's coming because there's been a keen interest in, in a number of nutritional programs throughout the country and lymphatic function and dysfunction. So I expect that that's going to be picked up on more and more so. We, we've done a little of that here and I expect it to be changed elsewhere as well. But certainly I think that we'll see some changes in, in the near future in terms of therapies that are chronically, are used for many chronic inflammations that m appear that they may have good chances of being effective in modulating the chronic lymphedema associated with a number of different lymphatic dysfunctions. Those are at the point where they're just beginning to enter, uh, they're just finishing some you know, preclinical trials and so they're not necessarily in clinical trials yet, but I hope that they will go into those soon. And those aren't done by me, they're done by other investigators around the country.
Um, next question is, can lymph nodes stop operating if becoming clogged with debris as detailed in your talk? Um, so certainly, um, and that's an extreme condition. That can happen, for instance, during gross metastases of cancer cells in the lymph node. We know that they degrade as they proliferate. And those cancer cells metastasize the node and, and, and invest there and start growing uncontrolled that they will disrupt the normal architecture of the lymph nodes, including the blood vessels and lymph vessels and all the various immune cell zones, and not only clog it, but completely disrupt its ability, almost disrupt its ability to generate flow. And in fact, in doing so, they may do that in a fashion to, in essence, impair immunity against themselves. Because if, if you don't have normal flow through that, you can't get normal immune function activated through that, that process. And so it may be, it appears, in, in my imp impression is, that many metastatic cells, and it's not my area of expertise, but that many metastatic cells have co-opted the system that lots of immune cells use to traffic normally during in, in immune function uh, uh, trafficking. And they co-opt that same system and, and perturb it and use it to, in, in essence, provide them a great place to grow, a great place to metastasize to other parts of the body, and a, an a ideal place to do all those while impairing immunity. So, um, I think they will definitely stop functioning. In fact, one of the areas we're looking at now is in normal, not in, in, in metastases or even tremendous lymphedema, but in normal kind of pathological, early pathophysiological responses to an immune response, like an infection. Uh, does the dynamics of lymph flow and blood flow in the node alter the function of the node by changing the way you deliver things to and from that node? We think that's very likely to be the case, and certainly there's a historical perspective for it, but the mechanisms by which that might occur are not well understood at all. And there's lots of groups now becoming very keenly interested in, in, in aware of that and studying that. Um, and next question is, knowing the vasomotor changes in the blood vasculature during exercise, is there a similar response in lymphatics? It's a great question, and one of those that's actually got, I can go to history and, and give you a pretty good answer to that. So from the perspective of those vessels, lymph vessels in the skeletal muscle directly that are uh, activated and, and, and driven by this extrinsic skeletal muscle contraction and relaxation that occurs during exercise, lymph flow can go up enormously uh, from very low basal rates since there's low blood flow in the skeletal muscle when you're at rest. When the muscle is exercising, blood flow increases dramatically. The permeability of the vessels, blood vessels in that muscle increase and so more stuff leaks out of them and then you have to activate the lymphatics to remove that stuff or the blood or the the muscle will swell and you can develop if it doesn't work right you can develop compartment syndrome a very painful um, problem and in fact we know that under normal conditions when the blood flow goes up and the fluid leakage out of blood vessels goes up associated with exercise lymph flow also goes up dramatically and very easily can go up 10, 20 fold in some cases and sometimes even higher depending on the type of exercise. So the short answer is the flow changes are actually very, very similar. And so that normally with typical exercise, you won't uh, get tremendous changes in pressure, but you can do exercises that will not do that. So for instance, isometric exercises where you're generating lots of tension but not doing a lot of cyclical contraction and relaxations, that's very different. And you can very rapidly increase interstitial fluid pressure because you're not pumping the lymphatics extrinsically then. And so it all depends on the type of exercise and what's going on. Now, are there changes in those vessels to um, in the vasomotor tone, that is the pumping activity, intrinsic pumping? Well, we know in most cases in the skeletal muscle lymphatics, they don't have very strong pump, intrinsic pumping activity. They rely on this extrinsic pump. And so in that case, it's tightly tuned to skeletal muscle activity. But what happens to the vessels right outside of them? Because the vessels outside of the skeletal muscle rely on the intrinsic pump to generate uh, lymph flow because the pressure gradients are normally opposing that. While lymph flow increases during exercise from the muscle itself, it exits that muscle and it enters these uh, vessels right outside of it. There it has to be pumped effectively to get to the node and, and elsewhere, to back to the blood. And we know there that the increases in pressure and flow generated by increased flow out of the muscle and lymph will stimulate the activities I talked about and stimulate the vessels that lie right outside the lymphatic uh, um, structures in the outside of the skeletal muscle. And we 
are, are investigating that not so much in skeletal muscle now. We did a number of years ago, but we are actually looking at that now in the heart because that works in a similar fashion, um, and we believe that similar ideas occur. Okay, another question I just got is, MLD a good thing for lymphedema patients? Well, um, I, I, this is a bit outside of my expertise, so I feel a little uncomfortable trying to make believe I know a lot about it. But from my understanding, since I'm not a clinician, is right now it's one of the most effective therapies that we have. And it's, prob you know, it's one of the only games in town, in essence. And so between that and compression bandaging, and we know that those two things, if done correctly, can be effective in um, minimizing the uh, changes in limb volume and limb uh, and, and decreases in limb function, if done correctly in a, in a very rigorous fashion. Um, you know, we hope, and, and people like us, and even the people that, uh, that use MLD clinically that are also uh, studying other things experimentally, we all hope that we can develop not only the physical techniques, because um, we can, you can use some of those to potentially stimulate some of the activities I've talked about, but also develop some better understanding of these mechanisms so you can use drugs that can help stimulate the lymphatic pumping in the right type of patients that needs it or inhibit it in other patients that might need its inhibition. And we hope that in, in the not too distant future that we'll be able to find drugs that specifically target lymphatic uh, muscle, for instance, or lymphatic endothelium to do that. And there's a number of groups working around the world to do so. Um, um, we're just not at the point where many of them are going into clinical trials. We are not at the point where many of them are going to clinical trials yet. Uh, I think that's it. And so I, I like to thank everybody and like to thank Learn and uh, all the members of it for the opportunity to do so. And they have my email, and you can find it since I'm part of the, the, the Learn uh, Scientific Advisory Board, Medical Advisory Board, if anyone else wants to ask me questions in the future. Thank you, and have a good day.